Hey everyone, I hope you are well. Dr. D here and in this video we are going to be preparing for practical examination 2 for biology 2420. So let's get started. So practical 2 will pick up where practical 1 left off. Remember practical 1 covered all the labs in the first half of the semester, uh, what I'm highlighting here. Um, practical 2 will not include that material. Practical two will include all the material since practical one. So that starts with the ectoparasites lab. So let's get started with that ectoparasites lab. Let me find the ectoparasites lab. Uh, here it is. And let's go over some key concepts here, you guys. Uh, so with uh, ectoparasites, I think you should know the difference between insects, which have three body segments. You should know what those body segments are called. And six legs versus arachnids, which have two major body segments, the cephalothorax and the abdomen, right? And they have eight legs. Also, you should know that the two examples that we studied of arachnids are the ticks, you don't need to know the difference between hard ticks and soft ticks, but you should know that ticks are arachnids, and remember, mites are also arachnids. All the other insects that we studied are not mites and, uh, I'm sorry, not uh, uh, arachnids. The other, the other insects were all insects. The other ectoparasites, I should say, were all insects. All right, so... You should know about the flea, which is an insect. Uh, you should be able to identify the flea uh, under a microscope. You should know about the louse, uh, and you should be able to identify that under a microscope. A tick, in general, under a microscope. Uh, a mite, a bed bug. Again, tick, flea, louse, mite, bed bug. And also, do you recall, we also looked at mosquito and we may have looked at housefly but that may be less important you don't need to know the scientific names usually um, you just need to know the common names like hard tick uh, or louse you don't need to know the scientific name there um, so that's what i would want to know and remember these ectoparasites are these biting insects that can spread disease they are examples of vectors all right, moving on. Helminths, right? Helminths. Let's talk about helminths. Let's go to the helminths lab. And what do you need to know about them? Helminths. There we go, helminths. All right, so helminths. We need to know that helminths are worms. We've got the trematodes, which are the flukes. You need to know that the cestodes are the tapeworms. The nematodes are the roundworms. And remember what I wrote on the board? Uh, for this, let me pull this up. This is a nice reminder of what we talked about. Let me show you this. Okay, remember the, the nematodes here. The nematodes are the roundworms. They can form cysts. These were the examples, the hookworm, heartworm, pork roundworm, and pinworm. You may also want to know the the technical uh, scientific nomenclature, the scientific name for these as well. And then we talked about the platyhelminthes, and I told you that these are the flukes. Uh, so the examples there were uh, the, the flukes, the flukes were the trematodes. The, the platyhelminthes includes also the tapeworms. Okay, so the tapeworms are the cestodes, the trematodes are the flukes, that's right. The trematodes are the flukes. The cestodes are the tapeworms. The trematodes, uh, you remember, these included the fasciola, the liver fluke, schistosoma, the blood fluke. And fasciola looked like uh, a leaf. Remember, it looked like a, let me show you fasciola real quick. Hold on, let me get this over here. And on the other side, I want... Mm, not this, I want this, yeah. Okay, look, fasciola looks like this. It looks like a, a leaf, right, fasciola. That's a fluke, the, the liver fluke, okay? Schistosoma looks like this. And do you remember schistosoma had that interesting mating 
where the uh, shorter, more broad female um, fit along the, the 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 longer, more slender male fit along the, the groove on the shorter, more broad female like this, and so that's how they met uh, made it. Long, slender male fits along female body groove. All right, so those are the flukes. Now let's talk about the cestodes. Remember the tapeworms. Tapeworms. You need to know the body parts of the tapeworms. The there's the sucker. Okay, there's the sucker here where my mouse is. There is the head, and then you've got the body segments. The segments called the proglottids. Okay, so the the head is called the scolex, the scolex. And uh, you've got the proglottid. So you should know those terms, scolex, proglottid, sucker. Um, and you should know that the tapeworms, tapeworms are hermaphroditic, meaning they have male and female parts. And the example here is tania. Tania is the tapeworm, okay, the typical tapeworm. Okay, be able to identify that. All right, what else are we missing? Oh, by the way, remember... Uh, back to nematodes. Uh, nematodes are the round worms, remember, that can form cysts. Remember the hookworm? Let's find the hookworm here. Yes, hookworm. Be able to identify that. Dirofilaria, the heartworm. Heartworm look like uh, angel hair pasta. Remember we saw that in the lab, look like angel hair pasta. I don't think we have a picture of it here in the manual, but they're really long. Uh, slender, almost looks like pasta. Trichinella, pork roundworm. Remember here? Look at this right here where my mouse is. Trichinella look like uh, little circles. In These are the cysts, the trichinella inside of the pork uh, tissue. So right here in pink, this is pork tissue. Pork tissue. And here you have the trichinella inside of the pork tissue. So be able to identify that. Oh, here's the dirofilaria. Here's the heartworm. Remember I said it's long and slender. It looks like angel hair pasta and they can get quite long. And then the pinworms. So you should be able to identify the pinworm. See, this is why it's called the pinworm. It's got this pinworm head. Okay. So that's about it for the worms. Um, you don't need to know the uh, eggs, or uh, be able to identify the eggs. You just need to know the organisms themselves. And uh, like I said, anything I highlighted on this on, on this overview here. Perfect. So we've moved on. Ectoparasites, helminths, uh, then uh, spring break, and then the rest of it was online, but we had our unknown project. Remember for the unknown project, one thing you might know want to know about the unknown project is this. Let me show you. Where's the unknown project? Where am I missing it? Am I just missing it? Oh, unknown. One thing you might want to know is the term, the family Enterobacteriaceae. Remember that term these are the gram-negative family of your unknown. So you, should, you may want to know that we studied the gram-negative family Enterobacteria ECE. Okay, other than that, do you remember we did uh, oxygen tests? So you should know how the oxygen tests work. I think I may have a handout here, uh, but let's go to oxygen requirements here. You should know this. You should know the concentration of oxygen remember candle jar has three to five percent oh i'm sorry eight to ten percent oxygen you should know that candle jar has eight to ten percent oxygen you should know that uh normal air has 22 percent oxygen normal air has 22 percent oxygen and you should know that the gas pack has zero percent oxygen remember gas pack 0% oxygen, candle jar, 8 to 10% oxygen, so less than uh, normal ambient air. And ambient air has 22% oxygen. So definitely know those terms. Uh, and uh, the, you know, the terms candle jar, uh, gas pack, and air. And also the uh, oxygen levels in each. 
Okay. Also, you may want to know for the practical, you may want to know how oxygen is absorbed in the in the in the um, gas pack in the gas pack container. Uh, the sachet contains absorbic acid and activated carbon, which reacts on exposure to air. So when you open this little sachet, uh, it will remove the oxygen and CO2 is produced. Okay, so do know how the um, sachet works in the gas pack. And of course, in the candle jar, the candle burning, uh, that's what uh, depletes the oxygen inside of the candle jar and lowers it. All right, so uh, another thing is this, um, this, this uh, 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 thioglycolate broth. Do you guys remember the thioglycolate broth? So thioglycolate broth has this chemical, thioglycolate, which binds to any free oxygen in the medium. So if there's oxygen, it will turn, it will turn pink. Okay, uh, it, it's also the thioglycolate is there to uh, reduce the oxygen inside of the medium, right? It's to reduce the oxygen inside of the medium. Okay, uh, what else do we need to know here? So yeah, thioglycolate broth has a reducing agent in it, the thioglycolate, which binds, binds to free oxygen in the medium. Okay, so if we ask you what is the what what is the function of thioglycolate inside of the thioglycolate broth, you should know that the function of the thioglycolate is to, you know, deplete the oxygen inside of the media, to bind to the oxygen inside of the media, and lower the oxygen in, inside of the, the media, right? And then an indicator resazarin resazarin is there to turn pink if there's higher oxygen, high levels of oxygen in the medium. So you don't want too much uh, oxygen in this medium or else it will turn pink. Okay, so the res resazarin is the oxygen indicator that turns pink and the thioglycolate, uh, you know, it, it removes the oxygen. It binds to any free oxygen, uh, making it not available to the creatures inside. Okay, so uh, depending on where the bacterium grow, if the bacterium can grow throughout this tube, that means they are, for example, facultative anaerobes. If they can only grow near the top, they are microaerophilic. If they can only grow near the bottom, they are strict anaerobes. If they can only grow at the very, very top, they are strict aerobes, right? Because remember, down at the bottom of this tube, there's the least amount of oxygen, and up near the t surface, that's where the most amount of oxygen is. Great. I think that's all we need to know about oxygen requirements. So if you have three plates like this, you know, and they ask like, um, you know, here's the bacteria, bacteria A, B, or C, you know, so C, the bacteria C is plated on all, all three of these plates. Bacteria A is plated on all three of these plates. Bacteria B is plated on all three of these plates. You know, we could ask questions like which of the bacterium uh, is uh, most likely a strict aerobe, or which of the bacterium is most likely a strict anaerobe, or which of the bacterium is a facultative. So facultative would grow in all three. So A, A appears to be facultative. See how it grows on A, uh, on, on ambient air, on gas pack, and on candle jar. Well, if it didn't grow in the gas pack, well, then it would be more of an aerobe. If it didn't grow in ambient air, it would be more of an anaerobe. So you get the point. If it only grew in candle jar and none of the others, it would be a microaerophile. So you get the point. All right, very good. So that's it for for oxygen requirements. Let's move on. Mm -hmm. So we've done oxygen requirements. Now we've got the Invic tests, phenol red broth, oxidase catalase. Let's talk about these tests. Uh, let's talk about these tests. So let's start with Invic tests. The Invic tests. Okay, so with Invic, you should know what Invic stands for. You should know it stands for Indole, Methyl Red, Vogpuskur, Citrate, and H2S. That's what Invic stands for, Invic. Uh, we may ask that. And then 
what do we need to know? We need to know uh, what is going on with the methyl red test, the Volk Pasteur test, the citrate test, and the SIM test. You should know what the SIM test tests for, right? SIM test. So the SIM test tests for indole, H2S, and motility. All right. So if you inoculate a SIM test, remember you have to inoculate it with a stab. Uh, if it turns black, what is that indicative of? If it turns black, black after incubation, that's indicative of H2S. If it doesn't turn black after incubation, that means that it did not produce H2S. It's H2S minus. Motility, it's not a great test for motility, but if you see fuzzy, if you see cloudiness inside, you can tell that the bacteria are mo modal. If, if you don't see cloudiness, if you see the bacteria only along the stab line in this deep, then the bacteria are not modal. There's also a reagent. You need to know that there is a reagent for this test. You add COVAX reagent, and if COVAX reagent reacts, there will be a pink line, uh, and that's indicative of indole production, indole production. All right. If there's no pink line at top after you add the COVAX reagent, that's indole negative. Okay. Uh, I think I summarize all that here. Let me show you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Check this out. So let me show you. Over here, here are the INVIC tests. Remember, indole, INVIC test stands for indole methyl red. Vogue Pasteur Citrate H2S. The SIM test, which I just told you about, what did that test? It tests for indole, motility, and H2S production. So you first check for motility by looking for cloudiness. Check for H2S, did it turn black or not? Is there a black precipitate or not? Check for indole, how do you do that? You add six to eight drops of the COVAX reagent. If it turns hot pink, it's, it's indicative of indole. The methyl red test, the methyl red test, uh, let me just summarize it here instead of looking at that. You pour one third of the MRVP tube into a sterile tube, add six to eight drops of methyl red reagent. You need to know that for the methyl red test, the, the reagent is called methyl red reagent. If it's yellow, it's negative. If it's pink, it's positive. Uh, so let me show you. Look at the methyl red test, see? Methyl red test, if it's yellow, it's negative. If it's pink, it's positive. And this is after incubation, after you've added the methyl red reagents. Okay, next is the Vogue Pasteur test, right? Uh, Vogue Pasteur test. Where did my, mm. yeah, VP test. So, oh, by the way, the methyl red test, you should know that it detects glucose used. Methyl red detects glucose use. The VP test, the Vogue Pasteur test, detects acetoin. Okay, detects acetoin. First, you add 12 drops of Barrett's A, then four drops of Barrett's B reagent. So you should know the, the reagent is called Barrett's A or Barrett's B. You mix and let sit 20 minutes. Yellow is negative, red is positive. So take a look. Yellow is negative, pink is positive. Okay, N negative for VP positive for VP. If it's if it's pink, that means acetoin. Great. Now, citrate test. Citrate test was a green slant, a green slant that you inoculate by inoculating with the loop along the slant. After incubation, if the citrate is still green, if the slant is still green, that's negative for citrate uh, and here, if there's po if there's a blue, royal blue, I should say, royal blue color change, that's positive for citrate use. In case positive for citrate use, and I wrote that here on this, uh, on this here, citrate checks for citrate use. If it's green, negative. If it's blue, it's positive. So why does it turn blue? Well, you should know that there is. You should know this for the practical. There is a color indica indicator already in the slant called bromthymol blue. This is not a reagent that you add later. This is a chemical that's already mixed in with the slant. It's a, it's a color indicator called bromthymol blue. And it turns blue when it's alkaline. When there is citrate use, this causes an alkaline pH change, and that causes 
the color to turn blue. Okay, so now we know the Invict tests. Invict tests are SIM, methyl red, VP, and citrate. Okay, so you should know those for the practical as well. Great, I think that's all we need to know. And definitely know all the re reagents, right? Covax reagent was for the SIM test. Methyl red reagent was for the methyl red test. A Barrett's A and B was for the VP test. And there was no reagent for the citrate test. The color indicator was already mixed in. The bromthymol blue was already mixed in. All right, perfect. Next. TTC, we already know from lab one, uh, or practical one, I should say. Oh, the phenol red broth. You know what the phenol red broth means? It means the carbohydrate tests. Where are the carbohydrate tests? Um, here, carbohydrate utilization. That's what phenol red broth means, okay? So you should know this lab for the practical exam. These are very simple to understand. Carbohydrate tests. Look, remember this is the this is the test where it's yellow. And um, oh, I'm sorry. It starts out red. It starts out red. The broth, uh, the carbohydrate use broth starts out red because of the color indicator phenol red. Let me show you. Let's go back to this. Let's go back to this here. So take a look here. Do I have it here? Carbohydrate use, I don't think I have it here. I thought I had it here. No, gosh, I don't have it here. But that's fine. Yeah, I don't see it here. I'll just explain it. Um, so here, what you need to know about the carbohydrate use test is that there's phenol red is the color indicator. It's not a reagent. It's something that's already mixed in with the tube. So phenol red is red when more neutral, and it turns yellow when it's acidic, when, when, when it's reduced, when there's a acidic environment. So if the bacteria can use the sugar that's mixed in this tube, let's say there's glucose mixed into this tube, if the bacteria can use the glucose, well then they will reduce their environment and they will cause a pH change to an acidic or low pH environment and that will change the color of the tube yellow. So if you see a yellow tube after incubation, that means positive for that sugar use. Let's say it was glucose, then it turned yellow, then you could say the bacteria did uh, use glucose. If if it was lactose sugar and it and it stayed red, then you could say the bacteria did not use the that lactose sugar. Okay? So you could add a sugar of your choice and, you know, of course the phenol red is mixed in as well. So what is this inverted tube in the test called? The inverted tube you should know that for the practical. What's the inverted tube called? The inverted tube is called the Durham tube. The Durham tube. I think that term is somewhere up here. I don't see it. It doesn't stand out to me, but you should know that that inverted tube is called the Durham tube. I know. Yeah, here you go. The Durham tube. What is the purpose of the Durham tube? You should know that. You see, it's an inverted test tube. It will capture gas. If your bacteria use the sugar, there's one of two options, right? Uh, either the bacteria uses the sugar and does not produce gas, in which case the test will turn yellow, but there won't be a bubble in the Durham tube, or the bacteria will use the sugar and produce gas, in which case you will see a yellow tube and you will see a bubble in the Durham tube. Does that make sense? So in this case, you would say, the bacteria used the sugar and produced gas. In this case, you would say the bacteria used the sugar only. If it stays red, what does that mean? That means the bacteria did not use that sugar. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. That's all there is to the carbohydrate utilization tests. What else? Oxidase, catalase. Okay, let's talk about these. Oxidase, catalase. Where did I talk about those? 
I think we talked about those in the previous exam, but just remember, um, yeah, actually, a practical one had oxidase and catalase in it, I believe. Or maybe it didn't. Let's go ahead and explain it anyway. Let's see if I can find oxidase and catalase somewhere. Mm. Could have sworn I had a nice oxidase and catalase rundown somewhere here for you. Let me just look for it real quick. Give me a second. All right, guys, I found it. So with catalase test right here, use, um, remember you put some bacteria on a glass slide and then added the reagent hydrogen peroxide. The hydrogen peroxide is the substrate for the enzyme catalase. So these bacterium would use catalase to break down. Hi, Tig. You want to join me? Oof. Tig's making a cat meow. Hi. There you go, Tig. Mm. All right. So Tig's joining us. So again, uh, if the bacteria can produce catalase, the enzyme, well then when you add the hydrogen peroxide, you will see tiny bubbles. So tiny bubbles are indicative of catalase uh, activity. If there are no bubbles when you add the hydrogen peroxide, that was uh, negative for catalase activity. Another thing, oxidase. With oxidase, you put bacteria on a filter paper, use the wooden stick, and then uh, added a drop of the reagent called oxidase reagent. The reagent is called oxidase reagent. If it turned blue within a set amount of time, I believe a minute, that was indicative of cytochrome oxidase. So if it turns blue in a minute, that means the bacterium are cytochrome oxidase positive. If it did not turn blue within a minute, that would mean it's cytochrome oxidase negative. <clears throat> so that's the oxidase test. What other tests are there? Let's go back to our outline here. Okay, so we've done Invic, phenol red, oxidase, catalase, ah, nitrate test. This one is a little cumbersome. Nitrate reduction test. So recall how this works. And Tig's just joining me here. Oh, oh, Tig's moving the screen. Let me. Uh, he's trying to lay on the keyboard. Do you want to check him out? Hold on. There he is. Oh, I don't know if he has more. All right. All right. Okay. All right. Hey, Tig. So anyway, uh, let's go back up here. Nitrate test. I think I have a nice um, overview of the nitrate test for you. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Um, where'd it go? Nitrate. <clears throat> Here we go. So look at the top left here. With the nitrate test, you need to understand what is the fate of the nitrate in the test. Nitrate means NO3. <clears throat> Did the nitrate get reduced to NO2 nitrite? Did the nitrate become nitrogen gas, N2 gas? Did the nitrate become ammonia, NH, actually uh, it should be NH3, or did the nitrate not uh, get processed at all? Did the nitrate stay nitrate? Okay, so there were four outcomes for this test. Either nitrate becomes reduced to nitrite, nitrate becomes nitrogen gas, nitrate becomes ammonia, or nitrate stays nitrate. To do that, you're going to use the reagents, um, the, the reagents called nitrate reagent A, nitrate reagent B, and you may or may not need zinc as well. 
Okay, so let's talk about how this works. <clears throat> All right, look at this. If you add, <clears throat> oh, first of all, after inoculation, if you see, uh, oh yeah, if you see a bubble inside of the Durham tube, remember the Durham tube, if you see a bubble, that means that nitrogen gas was produced. So you got nitrogen gas. If, <clears throat> if you don't have nitrogen gas, let's say you add the reagents nitrate A and nitrate B. If you add those and uh, there is no color, no color, okay? Uh, that means that you need to move on to the zinc uh, to the zinc test. If you added nitrate A and nitrate B and the color turns red, well that means that uh, nitrate became nitrite. Okay, so again, <clears throat> after inoculation, you come back, you check your tube. If there's a bubble in there in the Durham tube, that means nitrate became nitrogen gas. Okay, there you go. If there is no bubble in there, you need to add the reagents nitrate A and nitrate B. If it turns red, what does that mean? If it turns red, that means nitrate was reduced to nitrite. If it does not turn red, what do you do? Then you move on to part two, which means you add zinc. Okay, you add zinc. If you add zinc and it turns red or pink, that means that there was no reaction. Nitrate stayed nitrate. If, there, if it doesn't turn red at that point, that means nitrate was reduced to ammonia. Okay, I know there's a lot to go through there, but uh, this is a step-by-step -step process. Again, you check out your nitrate <clears throat> test if there is a bubble, that means nitrate became nitrogen gas. If there's no bubble, you add a, a nitrate reagent A and B. If it turns pink, nitrate became nitrite. If it does not turn pink, you add zinc. If, you, if the zinc causes it to turn pink or red, that means there was no reaction. Nitrate remained nitrate. If you add the zinc and it did not turn red, that means that nitrate became ammonia. Uh, I know it's a little confusing, so please go ahead and, you know, uh, look over this. You may have to read it a couple times and watch the video again to really understand that test, okay? Next, the decarboxylase test. Decarboxylase test. Let's talk about that. Here it is, okay? Decarboxylase test. Okay, decarboxylation of amino acids. This checks for uh, an enzyme called decarboxylase. The enzyme is called decarboxylase. Now there are different decarboxylases. There is arginine decarboxylase, ornithine decarboxylase, lysine decarboxylase, and, and uh, this is a control. The last one is a control um, for, for a negative control, you could call it. So what does decarboxylation mean? Decarboxylation means uh, removing the carboxyl group from an amino acid. So arginine decarboxylase is an enzyme that removes the carboxyl group from arginine. Ornithine decarboxylase removes the carboxyl group from ornithine, and lysine decarboxylase removes the, car de the carboxyl group from lysine. This results in a basic product. This results in a basic product. So if the if the if there is a decarboxylase for that amino acid, you get a basic pH shift. If not, there is no basic pH shift. So what do you have in there? A color indicator. The color indicator is already in the broth, and the color indicator is called Brum Cressel Blue. Okay. So let me show you something. Let's go to decarboxylation. Let me show you. So again, this is an amino acid. You see at the top left, the amino acid. Amino acids have an amino group. Amino acids have a carboxyl group, right? So 
if the decarboxylase enzymes remove this, the carboxyl group from amino acids. So if this amino acids was arginine, then arginine decarboxylase would remove this carboxyl group from arginine, if that makes any sense. And that would result in a basic product left behind, a basic product because you've got the basic amino group. Okay, um, So this is how it works. The decarboxylase test is purple. Okay, the decarboxylase test is purple. You inoculate it and then you add some oil. And then after inoculation, after inoculation, if it remains purple, if it remains purple, then the test was positive. If it becomes uh, yellow, then that test was negative. There was no decarboxylase inside. Okay, so what is this purple color? Remember, the purple color is called brom cresol purple, and it's not a reagent. It's it's a chemical that's already it's a color indicator that's already mixed in with the broth. Brom cresol purple will be purple or purple gray if positive, and it will be yellow if negative. Does that make sense? So let's go back to that <clears throat> again. Brom cresol blue is the color indicator. Basic conditions make it purple. Otherwise, uh, negative conditions will make it yellow. So non-basic conditions are yellow. Yes, Tig, are you headed out? All right, thanks for joining us. Peace. All right, now you guys can see me again. All right, sorry about that. That was fun. Always nice to get a visit from none other than Tig. All right. Um, and that's all we need to know about decarboxylase. That's good. Okay. So let's do uh, deaminase next. Deaminase. Deaminase. In this case, uh, we're looking at the opposite. Remember, decarboxylase means to remove the carboxyl group from an amino acid. Well, deaminase means to remove the amino group from an amino acid. So let me show you what that means. Let me show you real quick. Look, see, an amino acid, if you remove this part, this is called the amino group, that's what deaminase enzymes do. Deaminase enzymes remove the amino group from amino acids, and that results in a acidic product. So again, uh, we need a color indicator. Um, so in our test, we looked at a phenylalanine deaminase. That means the deaminase that specifically cleaves the amino group from the amino acid phenylalanine. In this case, the amino group is cleaved, resulting in an acidic product called phenylpyruvic acid. And the way you would test for that is by adding the reagent. You should know that the reagent for the deaminase test is called FeCl3 ferric chloride. You add six to eight drops of that, and if it turns avocado green, that's a positive result. So look at this. Here's after, here's after inoculation of the phenylalanine slant. Um, once you've added your six to eight drops of ferric chloride, if there is no green color, no avocado green color, that means that the deaminase was not present. If there is a color shift to green, avocado green, that means that the deaminase is present. Okay, so for this, you should know that um, an acidic product is formed, and you should know that the reagent is uh, ferric chloride. Perfect. Perfect, perfect. What else? Next, gelatin. Okay, gelatin. Uh, where's the gelatin hydrolysis test? Gelatin. You should know that enzymes have gelatin. Okay, um, I'm sorry. Uh, some bacteria have an enzyme that eats up gelatin. This is called gelatinase, is what you should know. Let me show you. There's gelatin in here. Gelatin test, gelatin test. Gosh, I don't see it here. So I'll just have to explain it. Let me explain it to you. Um, gelatin. So you see gelatin is a protein that... Uh, can make this solution solid, right? Gelatin, you know, like a jello and things like that, it's solid. If an enzyme 
can pro- uh, if a bacteria can produce an enzyme called gelatinase. Gelatinase is the enzyme that breaks down gelatin. Well, then the gelatinase will break down the gelatin, and the solution will become runny. Does that make sense? The solution will become runny. So. This is a negative, t- after incubation, this is a negative result for gelatinase, and this on top is a positive result for gelatinase. You see that? If the if the solution is runny like water, that means the, the bacteria produced the enzyme gelatinase. If it's not runny like water, there was no gelatinase. Okay, and remember for this one, you needed to put the tube on ice for 15 minutes or the fridge for 30 minutes. Do you remember why you needed to do that? You needed to do that so that you could confirm that the runniness is due to a positive result and not simply because of the heat causing the gelatin to be runny. Okay, so after uh, cooling, after cooling, if the test is still runny, that means that uh, the enzyme was present, gelatinase was present, and the bacteria are called gelatinase positive. Okay, good. Let's move on to the next one. That was a pretty easy one. Skim milk, also known as the casein test. The casein test. Here. Casein hydrolysis tests. It checks for caseinase. Caseinase means... Ace means the enzyme that breaks down casein, right? Caseinase. Casein is a milk protein. Uh, It's kind of got this opaque white color to it. Um, And caseinase breaks down the milk protein casein into amino acids. And a positive result has a halo, a clearing around the bacteria. So let me show you the casein test. Okay, here is a casein positive plate. You see how there's a halo around the bacteria, a clearing around the bacteria. That's a positive casein test. And see, casein is this milky substance here. It's uh, literally from milk, right? It's a milk protein. And caseinase breaks down that um, casein milk protein. So again, caseinase is the enzyme bacteria produce that breaks down the casein milk protein and that results in a clearing okay that's how you know if the bacteria if the bacteria uh, have the cannot make caseinase that means there is no clearing here you see a tiny clearing so that would be a very weak weak reaction but again if the bacteria cannot make caseinase then the opaque uh, white color is is coming up right onto the bacteria. The bacteria are unable to break down the milk protein, so you don't get this halo around the bacteria. So this is a strong reaction here and a very weak reaction here. All right, next one. Lipid test, lipid test, good. So let's look at that lipid test. Lipid plates are blue, and it checks for the... Uh, enzyme lipase. Some bacteria are capable of making lipase. Some bacteria are not capable of making lipase. Lipase is the enzyme that breaks down a lipid called tributyrin. Uh, This is uh, vegetable oil. Tributyrin is broken down into fatty acids. So the here the color indicator is methylene blue and the plates have tributyrin mixed in. So they've got a fat mixed in. Let's look at this real quick. Lipid hydrolysis, check this out. The plate is blue, remember why? Because there's a color indicator called methylene blue. If the bacteria cannot uh, produce lipase, then the bacteria grow on the plate and there is no clearing around the bacteria. If the bacteria do produce lipase, then look, there's a halo around the bacteria. Why? Because the bacteria break down the lipase that also results in a clearing of the methylene blue. Okay, that's simple as that. And there's no reagent to add or anything like that. And remember, these are examples right now. The, uh, um, the, the, the skim milk plate, the lipid t- plate, these are all examples of differential tests, not uh, selective plates, but differential. Okay, what else? Starch plate. Let's look at a starch plate. All right, so how does a starch plate work? Starch. 
starch test tests for amylase. Amylase is the enzyme that breaks down amylose. Amylose means starch. Okay. So what we've done is we've mixed starch in the plate ahead of time and bacteria are spread on the plate. If the bacteria can produce amylase, the enzyme, amylase will break down starch and that'll cause a halo around the bacteria, but only after you add the reagent iodine. You have to add the reagent iodine. So let's take a look at this. Here I've added the zigzag inoculation of bacteria on my uh, starch plate. And you re the reason it's purple is because I've added the reagent iodine. Iodine reacts with starch to produce a purple precipitant. Now, if I add the iodine and, there, and there's a halo, you see a clearing where there is no purple around my bacteria. You see this? Well, then that means that my bacteria produced amylase, the enzyme that breaks down starch or amylose, and that resulted in this clearing. Uh, and here you see the purple is far away because it, the, the enzyme couldn't get this far away from the bacteria. So again, you should know that starch plate is a differential test. Uh, the reagent is iodine. Iodine reacts with the starch to turn purple. If there's a halo, that means starch, uh, or I should say, amylase positive. If there's no halo, amylase negative. Perfect. Urea test. Let's talk about the urea test. Here's how the urea test works. I kind of drew it here on the top left. Urea is broken down by the enzyme urease to produce the alkaline product ammonia and CO2. Okay, Urea is broken down by urease into ammonia and CO2. And we can test for that with the test tube. Uh, the, the, um, the, ure the urea test is a test tube that you can inoculate. It's like a broth. And the, and the color indicator that's already mixed in is called phenol red. Now, because, of al because ammonia is an alkaline product, that means there's a basic pH change, and that causes phenol red to turn hot pink. Hot pink is positive. So let me show you what's going on here. Hmm. Urea hydrolysis test. You see, the test starts out like this. You put the bacteria inside. There's phenol red is the color indicator. If the bacteria can produce urease, urease will break down the urea, which is already inside of the test, and the urea will turn into ammonia, changing the color indicator phenol red from uh, more of a more of a light pink to a hot pink color. Okay, because because phenol red is interesting. When it's basic, it's hot pink. When it's neutral, it's red, and when it's acidic, it's yellow okay so hot pink means a positive result for uh, the bacteria do produce urease okay that's how that works there okay let's talk about the api 20e rapid identification okay api 20e rapid identification test what do we need to know about the api 20e um, the main thing we need to remember about the API 20E is the disadvantage. What's the disadvantage to this rapid test? Well, you must use gram-negative uh, bacteria, gram-negative bacillus bacteria. Okay. They also, another disadvantage is that it has to be grown on lactose-containing medium, right? On lactose containing medium. So you can only identify gram negatives and it has to be grown on lactose containing medium. But what are the advantages of the API 20 rapid E test, 20 E test? Um, well, you can quickly identify an unknown. You can quickly identify an unknown. That's a big advantage there. And how do you get the seven digit numerical profile? Well, you, you look at the wells in groups of three. So if this is a positive result, that's a positive result, and that's a positive result, you would add one plus two plus four. 
So the answer would be four, five, six, seven. So, so, so the first digit of the code would be seven. If the next three tests were all negative, then it would be zero. If the next three tests were negative, positive, negative, then the answer is two. Does that make sense? So um, if you were to get the seven digit numerical code, let me show you. Okay, let's go to API 20E. Let's look at the seven digit code. Uh, what does it tell you about the code? Um, I don't know if they have it here for you, but this is the interpretations. Here's how you know it's a positive result or a negative result. Um, you've got blocks of three tests. So if this is a positive result, positive result, positive result, you would add one plus two plus four. If this is negative, 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 then it's zero, zero, zero. Uh, that's how you get the seven digit code. Okay, that may or may not be on the practical. Next thing, now we're going to the staff and strep ID tests. Let me take a quick little break. We'll get back to this and start talking about staff and strep ID tests, followed by urine culture and bacteriophage, and then we'll be done. All right, let's take a little break. Hey everyone, let's finish up. Uh, so we left off, we're about to get to Staph and Strep ID, day one, Staph and Strep ID. Now, you should definitely know for the practical what selective media means versus differential. And remember that some plates are both selective and differential. Selective means that uh, the plate allows only a certain type of bacteria to grow and selects against another type of bacteria, which, mean, which means prevents another type of bacteria to grow. Differential, on the other hand, means that uh, of the bacteria that do grow, you can differentiate this type from that type. Okay. Now, um, there are a number of things you need to know for this practical. You need to know what the MSA test is. You need to know what a CNA test is. You need to know, again, the catalase test. Oh, SM110 plate, DNA test, coagulase test. Um, and uh, those are the big ones there. Uh, you should, yeah, you should know those for sure. So let's go through these. MSA. MSA test, uh, mannitol salt agar test. Okay, MSA test, mannitol salt agar test. I think I have a nice little uh, thing here, staff and strep. I can show you. Uh, yeah, here you go. Here's a nice one. Mannitol salt test. This is both a selective test and a differential test. It's selective because it has high salt. Remember, not all bacteria can grow in high salt. So if the bacteria grow on the MSA plate, that means they grow in high salt, which means what? What's the term for that when you can grow in high salt? That's right, it's a halophile. Now, of the bacteria that do grow, because there's phenyl red mixed in with the plate, if the bacteria can reduce the mannitol, if they can use mannitol, then the plate will turn uh, yellow. It will turn yellow because of the acidic byproduct of mannitol use. If the bacteria cannot use mannitol, the, the plate will remain red. Okay, so that's the mannitol plate. Let's talk about the CNA plate. The CNA plate. CNA plate is called Columbia Naledixic Acid Plate. And I think I have... No. <clears throat> Gosh. I have a nice CNA explanation somewhere here, or not, <laughs> here, CNA. So the CNA plate, remember, it's got, uh, CNA stands for Columbia Naledixic Acid. Naledixic Acid is the selective agent in the plate. 
nalidixic acid prevents gram-negative bacteria from growing and only, pre, pre, uh, only permits gram-positive bacteria from growing, uh, to grow. So it selects against gram-negatives and it selects for gram-positives. Okay, That's why the CNA plate is uh, selective. Now, it is also differential. Why? Because the CNA plate has blood in it. It has blood agar, right? Blood. If, uh, if, if the bacteria can grow, it's going to show a type of hemolysis. Do you remember hemolysis? Gamma hemolysis means no hemolysis. The bacteria just grow on the plate. Alpha hemolysis means the bacteria cause a slight rupture of the red blood cells, and this causes a bruising or greenish-brown effect around the bacteria. Beta hemolysis means that the bacteria that the uh, enzymes can uh, produced by the bacteria can completely destroy the red blood cells, and this causes halos to form. So let me show you. Let me show you this example. Here's an example of gamma uh, hemolysis. That means no hemolysis. Here is okay. Here is gamma. Here's beta. You see the halos that are around the colonies, a nice clear halo around the colonies. That's beta hemolysis. And then you see the bruising effect. This is alpha hemolysis, you see. So you should know that, again, the CNA plate uh, is both uh, selective because of the nalidixic acid, which selects against gram negatives and selects for gram positives. It is also differential because it allows you to look at gamma versus alpha versus beta hemolysis. Okay, what else do we need to know about? The SM110 plate here. SM110, what is that? It's simply a selective plate. It's not a differential plate, it's a high salt plate. So if bacteria can grow on SM110, then the bacteria are, um, are halophiles. Okay, simple as that. So we know what a MSA plate is, mannitol salt agar plate. We know what a SM110 plate is. We know what a CNA plate is. Um, how about DNAs? DNAs. Uh, let's talk about DNAs. DNAs is really straightforward. I wonder if there's a DNAs test here. Um, actually, let's get back to DNAs in a minute because uh, it's easier to look at this one here. This is a coagulase test. Let's talk about the coagulase test here. Okay, coagulase test. So, what you need to know is that a coagulase test starts out looking like this on the right. Uh, the reason it's solid is because this is um, rabbit plasma, okay, 5% rabbit plasma. Uh, you should know that the coagulase test, this uh, con uh, consists of 5% rabbit plasma, which you then inoculate with your loop with your bacteria. Now, a negative result would mean that the rabbit plasma remains solid like this. A positive result means that it becomes runny or kind of, uh, it doesn't have to become water, watery like water, but it might remain watery or clumpy, like kind of like a mucus-like consistency. And that means a positive result. Why? Well, because in the coagulase test, you have bacteria that can break down, break down plasma, okay? They can break down plasma. And if they break down the plasma, then uh, the, 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 uh, the rabbit plasma becomes runny, okay? So there you go. Uh, solid, negative result, runny like mucus, positive result. Okay, that's the coagulase test. And you should know that the reagent or the, the coagulase itself consists of 5% rabbit plasma. So very good. Uh, that's the coagulase test. Okay. So now we know the coagulase test, the phenol red test. We know all of these tests here. So I think we know all of the staff tests, correct? These are all of the staff tests. We know all of the staff tests. So now let's look at the... Oh, and by the way, you should know that staph aureus, in particular, staph aureus grow with a golden pigmentation. Okay, staph aureus grow with a golden pigmentation.
that's something good to know for the exam. Okay, uh, what else do you need to know? Mm, just trying to think of anything else um, that you might need to know. I'm just reading through here. Mm. Do, 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 do. I think that may be it. Yes, that may be it. Uh, if I think of anything else, I'll let you know. But that may be it for now. Now let's look at the streptococcus activities. So what do we need to know about streptococcus? Remember the, our day-to-day -day activities here. We looked at... Um, we grew the things in candle jars. We need to know what the CNA and blood auger plates. Are blood auger plates selective or differential? Blood auger plates are only differential, right? They allow you to differentiate between beta, gamma, and alpha homolysis because of the 5% sheep red blood cells. Whereas CNA plates are basically blood auger plates, but you've added what? You've added the selective agent called nalodixic acid. How about the bile esculin slant? Okay, so let's talk about the bile esculin slant. Bile esculin slants are both, uh, it's a slant that is that uh, is both selective and differential. Why is it selective? It's selective because there's bile, there are bile salts, I should say, inside of the slant, and only some bacteria can grow on bile salts, okay? Um, so if the bacteria can grow on the slant, that means the bacteria can grow in the presence of bile, uh, bile salts. Now, it's also differential because the slant will either remain brown or amber colored or it will become uh, almost black, it will, it will become dark. Now, what's the difference? If the bacteria can break down the sugar esculin, because there's esculin mixed in with this slant, that means the bacteria that do grow use esculin. If it cannot use esculin, the slant will not turn black. Uh, it's like a coffee black switch. Okay, what else do we need to know? How about the DNA plate? We should know about the DNA plate as well. I just don't see it here for some reason. But the DNA plate, so the DNA plate is a differential plate. It's a differential test. Why? Because you've mixed DNA and methyl green in with the plate. So the plate has a mint green color to it, a mint green color. And I think there is a DNA activity here. Let me see. Uh, DNA. Here it is. Look at this. DNA test. So you should know about this test. DNA production. The plate is minty green. Why? Because it's got uh, met, uh, methyl green in there, uh, right? Methyl green, methyl green in there. And it also has DNA mixed in with the plate. Now, if the bacteria grow on the plate, uh, but there's no halo around the bacteria like this, that means it's DNA negative. DNA is the enzyme that breaks down DNA. If the enzyme's not present, the enzyme is not breaking down the DNA, which is mixed in with the agar, and that leaves the methyl green intact. If DNA is present, the DNA breaks down the DNA, and that causes a clearing in the methyl green. So you see a halo around the bacterium. So you see a halo, DNA is positive. You don't see a halo, DNA is negative. Okay, simple as that. Next thing. I think we've covered everything there. Let me double check here to see if there's anything. <laughs> homolysis, yeah, of course, know the types of homolysis. Oh, by the way, streptococcus is always facultatively anaerobic and catalase negative, okay? Uh, you should know that. Streptococcus is always catalase negative Staphylococcus tends to be catalase positive, okay? Staph, catalase positive, strep, catalase negative. That's another big thing I almost forgot to tell you guys about. So please know about that. Okay, perfect. And I think that's everything we want to know about strep and staph. Perfect. So let's go back. What else do we need to know in general? 
urine culture. Urine culture. Let's talk about urine culture. The one thing I need you to know from urine culture is about the EMB test. EMB. Eosin methylene blue. EMB test. What you need to know is that this is both a selective test and a differential test. It's selective because it only allows gram negatives to grow. It selects against gram positive. The EMB test selects against gram uh, negatives and selects for gram positive. So only the, I'm sorry, I got that backwards. It selects against gram positives and only allows gram negatives to grow, okay? It selects against gram positives and only allows gram negatives to grow, okay? And why is it why is it differential? It's differential because of the bacteria that do grow. Um, if they turn like a dark purple, let me show you what I'm talking about. Let's go to that urine. Uh, that means they're lactose users. So let me show you the um, urine culture test. We need to know about the urine culture test. All right, look at this. Look at this. Mm, that's not it. Here, yes. Okay, so uh, the EMB, the, the bacteria that do grow are what? Gram positive or gram negative? They are gram negative. If they turn purple, if the colonies turn purple, that means um, lactose fermenter, lactose use. If they don't turn purple, that means a, a lactose non-fermenter. Okay, so purple, lactose fermenter, not purple, lactose non-fermenter. So that's the differential component of the EMB test. Okay, so very good, very good. Um, um, so do you know what the EMB test is versus the CNA test? Okay, these are good to understand. All right, what else are we doing here? So we talked about staph and strep. We talked about API, urine, bacteriophage. Let's talk about bacteriophage now. What do you need to know about bacteriophage? Oops, wrong thing. Let's go back here. Bacteriophage. All right, you need to know what a bacteriophage is. You need to know that bacteriophages are viruses which infect bacteria. Please know that bacteriophages are viruses which infect bacteria. And what are plaques on these plates? Plaques are, look, plaques are clearings in the plate caused by what? Caused by viral lysis of bacteria colonies, you see? So the bacteria will lyse because the virus will enter the lytic stage and that lysis of the bacteria leaves behind little craters, leaves behind little clearings, little, little clearings in the bacterial lawn. This is a bacterial lawn, okay? So there's a monolayer of bacteria on here. There's just a monolayer of bacteria. Where you see the clearings are where the plaques are. And plaques, again, are areas of bacterial lysis due to viral um, entry into the lytic stage. Okay, And if you want to calculate PFUs, PFUs are plaque forming units. This should look very familiar. This is the equation for, uh, for uh, measuring that. I don't think you need to know this for the practical, but you may. Um, this should look very much like the standard formula. Remember for standard formula, you were, you were calculating CFUs. Um, so um, it was like the number of bacteria on the countable plate over dilution of the tube times the amount plated. Well, here it's the number of plaques on the countable plaque plate over dilution over amount plated. Okay, those are the major things to know here. Uh, I don't think you need to know anything too special about this here. Okay. Yeah, that's, that should do it. Next thing. Let's go on to... Um, oh, serological testing. Serological testing. 
Let me show you that one. Serology. We need to know this, this manual as well. Serology. For the exam, you should know what is a heterophile antibody. Definitely know what is a halophile antibody. A halophile, um, I'm sorry, I keep saying halophile antibody. I mean heterophile, <laughs> heterophilic antibody. What is a heterophile antibody? Right here, this term right here. Heterophile antibody is an antibody that reacts against sheep and bovine RBCs, red blood cells. So heterophile antibodies are antibodies that react against two different antigens, in this case, sheep and bovine red blood cells, okay? Uh, heterophile antibody. The term heterophile antibody refers to antibodies having the capacity to react with certain antigens, which are very different from the ones inducing their formation. So um, antibodies usually attach to the antigen which was immunogenic, which caused their, their, their production. However, heterophile antibodies will stick to antigens other than those antigens that, cre that spawned their creation, okay? So please know what a heterophile antibody is. And then you should know that we did three tests, three serological tests, okay? And I've outlined them here. Let me show you this little outline which I'll try to provide for you guys. I've got a nice little outline here. Um, that's a good one, I think. Oh. Serology. So let's look here. Don't focus on the left side of this screen, but the right side. Okay. Let me show you. So, serology. We had one test, you need to know that for serology, we had one test, which is an unknown antibody test. The unknown antibody test was called the monospot test for Epstein-Barr virus. This is also the virus that causes mono, okay? Now, um, that's the one where you check for heterophile antibodies. Remember that? So. The unknown antibody test was the monospot test for Epstein-Barr virus, and it used this concept of heterophile antibodies to give you a positive result. The unknown antigen tests, we had two different unknown antigen tests, and by the way, I'm trying to keep this simple just for the sake of the review. I'm not going into all of the details um, that, we, that we went into in the class, but the unknown antigen tests, those were the two tests called the Difco Staph Latex Kit for Staph aureus and the Clearview test for Strept antigen. Okay, so these two tests are unknown antigen tests, so you're checking for uh, the presence of antigen. The monospot test was an unknown antibody test because you were checking for the presence of this heterophile antibody. So let's talk about the unknown antigen tests. Let's start with the Difco staph latex test. Here you're checking for the presence of Sareus by looking for a protein, uh, this clumping factor protein A that staph possesses. Okay, the Clearview test, you're looking for a strep antigen, uh, basically a, a antigen on the surface of strep uh, bacterium. Okay, um, those are the th major things to know. You don't need to know exactly how this strep works or how this agglutination works, but please know those major things, those major things I just highlighted about the serology tests. And I will try to um, provide you with all this information about the monos spot test and exactly how it works and the clear view test and the staph latex test and how it works too so you know in detail how it works but at least know those major concepts that I highlighted just here. All right everyone what's left I think that's about it um, if I missed anything let me know but I think those are the major concepts for the for the practical please know those concepts and I think you'll do just fine you've got your manual here to study all these manual modules here to study uh, and I think you'll be just fine alright so keep studying do your best 
uh, brush up on these concepts and I think you'll do well and finish off the semester strong. All right, keep up the good work. We're almost at the end and uh, hang in there and I'll catch you guys next time.